Hey everybody, this is Luke LaRockwalker. And I'm Paul Imperius. We're from True North Denture and Implant Center in Cochrane, Alberta, Canada. And we're excited to invite you to the Iva Claire Ballroom in Chicago. Come and join us on Saturday, February 24th from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. We'll be sharing our wisdom and tips and tricks for success. You'll learn how we transition from analog to a digital denture workflow. And how you can too. So, if you're making dentures and want to transition to digital success, come and see us. We can't wait to meet you and collaborate on your journey to a better smile. Come see many other speakers in the Iva Clark Ballroom during Lab Day Chicago. Also, Barb and I will be there all weekend recording anyone willing to sit down. So head over to VoicesFromTheBench.com forward slash Ivaclar for the full list of speakers. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Ivaclar. Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Greetings and welcome to episode 306 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name's Barbara. What's the happening, Barb? How are you? I've got my new sweatshirt on today, the last oh, day sweatshirt. Yes, I do. That means Florida is below 75? Uh, we're below, <laughs> we were below 60, so yes, I have a sweatshirt on. And boots and jeans. Oh, good timing for the sweatshirts to be down there. You know it, and I brought um, one of the shirts in for a really cool technician that works next to me, so I'm happy. That's awesome. Yeah. How are you? I'm doing really well. I don't know if I talked about this, but I kind of came across a unique opportunity. I was driving around visiting some dentists, and I ran across a dental assisting school. Ooh. And it's like a private school. I don't even know how dental assistants became dental assistants. I I guess I didn't understand, but this is a standalone kind of business. And they push through about 20 dental assistants through like a three-month program, six months. I don't know how long it is. But I just happened to jump in there and said, hey, I'm from a lab. I love education. What can I do? And uh, next week, I'm putting on a whole course on fabricating dentures and adjusting chair side. Wow, that is so great. To me, it's It's a great opportunity because I'm hitting all these dental assistants. They're all going to graduate. They're all going to end up in an office. And they're all going to remember that dude named Elvis that taught him how to adjust the denture. Yeah, that's pretty special. Yeah. You got it going on, partner. Labs, look for dental assisting schools in your area and hit them up. Give them some education. They only need like an hour and a half, two hours. But yeah, it's pretty exciting. I'm pretty excited to do it. Put together a nice little program. I'm learning myself some interesting dental terms that I really didn't understand before. So it's good all around. Good for you. So what's going on this week? Well, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about Lab Day Chicago. No. Yeah, but we're not going to do it this week because we talk a lot about it during this episode's conversation. Yes, we do. Yes, it's a great episode. But we're going to take a minute to talk about what we're doing in May. Oh, yeah. Barb and I, for the first time, we are taking the podcast international like physically international we've talked to a ton of international guests but we're actually leaving the united states you and i and your wife and my sister (laughs) there's family involved yes (laughs) but it's taken us a while we've always had dreams of going to ids or some other show we've been invited to canada that we couldn't get that to work out but this time the good people at exocad are holding their amazing conference that they call exocad insights in Mallorca, Spain. Oh, you even pronounced that correctly. Well done. I've been practicing. It happens (laughs) May 9th and the 10th. So we're going to be there both days, set up on this fantastic island off the coast of Spain, which just blows my mind that I'm going to be there. And we're going to be recording anyone that we can grab. We don't even care if they speak English or not. We do care if they speak English. (laughs) That's the same damn thing they say. Maybe we'll just sit there and just each of us speak our native language and hopefully a conversation will come out. (laughs) I don't know. I've never gone to a dental show that is in a place that English isn't the primary language. So I don't know. This is going to be interesting, but I'm super excited. We highly recommend 
everyone to go check out exocad.com forward slash insight 2024 or the link on this episode's show notes to see the list of really cool speakers they got going on, all the topics they're going to be covering, and then book your flight, get a room, and I have to emphasize this, the rooms are right on the beach. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Kristen and I, we already are on the beach, so, but hey. Well, to those in Indiana, this is pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> So make sure you come and join us and enjoy what is sure to be an epic time in Mallorca. So this week we get to talk to a well-known technician that somehow has escaped being on this podcast for almost six years. (laughs) Yep. Jessica Love, formerly known as Jessica Burrell, comes on the podcast to talk about her journey in dental technology. Joining Jessica is the greatest Canadian lore that we know, Laura Gilbert. Laura was just made general manager of Canada for Ivaclar, and she joins us to update everyone on what's happening in the Ivaclar ballroom during Lab Day Chicago. Other than us being there, of course. Other than us being there, of course. They got a few things going on. (laughs) But one of the speakers that weekend is Jessica Love. So we were happy to finally have her on the podcast. Jessica talks about her artistry past and what made her fall in love with lab work. And after a brief break for family, she decides to open her own lab in her house. And then when Emacs came around, she found a better way to teach it. Ivor Clark noticed, and Jessica, the speaker, and Jessica, the teacher, was born. Yeah, and she's awesome. I gotta say. And now she owns an amazing clinic called Capture Dental Health and Beauty Center that takes what a dentist sees in a mouth and can improve someone's overall physical and mental health. It's pretty fascinating. It is pretty fascinating. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. So join us as we chat with Laura Gilbert and Jessica Love. Whether you're looking to elevate your craftsmanship or looking to cut back on cost, look no further. Vita MFT teeth are the ultimate solution for creating lifelike and stunning smiles. Crafted with precision and backed by cutting edge technology, Vita MFT teeth offer unparalleled aesthetics and durability. And since Vita believes in the power of experiencing excellence firsthand, for a limited time only, they are offering you the chance to get a complimentary case sample. That's right, a full case absolutely free. Just visit VitaNorthAmerica.com forward slash free MFT. Don't wait any longer to start providing your customers a premium tooth at an economy price. Redeem your free case sample and if you're ready to buy, Vita will even give you an extra 10% off discount by shopping online on their newly launched online store. Join the Vita family today, and we appreciate your support of the podcast. Hey, it's Candular from Switzerland. We have been designing teeth since 1936. Successful tooth design knows only one benchmark, your own standards and dose of your patients. Discover our Toothline PhysioSet TCR with new 18 anterior molds, manufactured specially for the US market and your daily work at your bench. If you are looking for new options in removable, get to know us at candular.com and find out more. You will be supported and supplied by our authorized dealer, Edmunds Dental Supply. Candular. High end only. Voices from the bench. The interview. We have an exciting episode today. We are back this year again talking about LMT Lab Day Chicago in the Ivaclar room. And joining us is one of the speakers that's going to be there that weekend. And someone that's honestly long time coming to be on this podcast. Oh, yeah. Jessica Love, the technician formerly known as Jessica Burrell. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yes, long, long time. I, I know we've talked about doing this a couple times in the past. So 
I'm excited to finally be part of your podcast series. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And of course, we couldn't have this conversation without the lady that makes all of Lab Day Chicago and the Iva Clark room happen. I'm <laughs> sure she doesn't do it alone, but we're giving her all the props. Yep. Laura Gilbert, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Wow. Those are lots of props. There's a lot of people <laughs> behind it, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it on behalf of the team. Yeah, there you go. You have a new yeah. role at Ivaclar now, don't you? I do. I'm uh, transitioning from director of marketing for technical for North America to a Canadian role where I've accepted the general manager position in Canada. So that is still in transition. We're trying to find someone to replace me. But awesome. I, I keep telling everybody, like, don't worry, I'm not leaving you. <laughs> I'm I'm still here and really passionate about the technical business, so I'll still be involved. Well, congratulations, I should say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Is that better title, less area to cover? <laughs> You've lost America. <laughs> uh, I, lost, I lost a whole country. Um, it's, it's different. It's more of the entire organization that spans from sales, to operations and you know customer service and and pretty much everything that makes the place run here in Canada um, and all of our Canadian customers. But I have a near and dear heart to marketing, and so I know that I'll be pulled in and and I'll give my my opinion whether they like it or not, <laughs> whether they've asked for it or not. But yeah, awesome. Well, yeah, definitely. Congratulations. Looking forward to seeing you in Chicago. Thank you. So, Jessica, yes. let's find out your story. <laughs> Even long before we started this podcast, you were everywhere, it seemed like. You were either speaking or talking about a printer. How did you end up in dental technology? Oh, boy, that's quite the story. I thought I'd be a starving artist in the 90s, honestly. <laughs> I, graphic design was not really existent at the time. The computers were all going to end in 1999. And 1999, I figured out I better do something with my life. And Wait a minute. Were you really scared of the Y2K? <laughs> I think everyone was a little little scared about it. We just And then it's just how do we make how do we make a career as an artist? You know, in the nineties, it's like, do I paint paintings and try to sell my artwork because you feel like you're only become famous after you're dead. Right. That's how oh, most yeah. artists are. So pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just didn't know what to do with my artistry. And I figured I had a friend tell me to become a hygienist and she's like, just go to school, become a hygienist, figure out your art thing along the way. So I went to a school called American Medical Dental Institute was its name at the time. It used to be in Provo, Utah. And I went and interviewed for the hygiene program and kind of stumbled across the dental technology program. So the dental technology program was there in the same center and they had an entrance exam and a sculpture and a drawing and they test your hand dexterity. And I just, I fell in love with it oh my gosh, this is art and I don't have to put my hands in anyone's mouth. This is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just, I don't, I don't really think anyone grows up saying they want to be a dental technician for a living, you know, when they grow up. But, um, yeah. but I, I definitely stumbled across it and fell in love with it so fast. I, I love the artistry. I love math and science and art. So for me, it was just a perfect balance of all of it. So you went to school. Yeah. So I went to school. That school no longer exists. I believe they turned it into Maritech that used to be in Draper or Sandy, Utah. And I think that's closed down now too. So yeah, it was an interesting school. It was fun. At that time, they were going through some uh, disputes with the owners and teachers. And so some days we didn't have teachers. Some days we were teaching ourselves. I remember we caught the lab floor on fire trying to figure out casting. So it was oh, nice. pretty entertaining. <laughs> I really valued the schooling program that we were able to focus a lot on production, timing, and the terminology, terminology and anatomy. We did spend a lot of time in school focusing on the terminology and anatomy. Now, it was based off of the PTC program, which some of you may know is is. Uh, we've advanced. We'll just say that nicely. We've advanced a long way um, in our understanding of anatomy. So it was a great foundation. But it actually taught production and timing and yeah, it was all you had to set a timer. So every tooth that you did, you would set this timer and you had to hurry and complete it within a certain amount of time. 
So they were building the foundation of anatomy in, but also with the, the mindset of being mindful of your time. I've never heard of this being taught in a dental technology yeah, school. It's right. usually like we had three days to wax <laughs> a full cast. <laughs> yeah, this was very heavily focused on production time. So it, it Interesting. Kind of became a competition with all the students in the program to see who was faster you know someone's timer would go off and they'd be done before someone else and then it was personal it was competitive <laughs> <laughs> so which is which is great I think the last time I timed myself I was about 52 to 54 units in a day of waxing so wow. I, I'm that's a lot very fast with wax. that is a lot <laughs> yeah. I, I love wax I, I feel like once you become a ceramist you realize if it breaks you just melt it back together it's therapeutic ceramics is a little more intense so I can wax very fast yes did this school go through everything fixed removable i mean all aspects of it i was very heavily focused you know first you start in the model room learn how not to glue your fingers together Mm -hmm. and then just it was i really value how it took you through every single step and how to properly fabricate each step so model room into metal design a lot of metal work um, a lot of pfm a lot of casting so yeah, waxing, casting, PFM, that was kind of the thing back in the days, right? Like Empress, I started to get my hands on in, in 2000. And by 2000, 2001, I was all ceramic um, yeah. and did very little PFM. But man, PFM, I feel like that's where it really tests your art, artistic ability to mask this metal coping and then build a beautiful central over the top of it. And you're really masking something black underneath. So it takes a lot of talent, a lot of skill and a lot of training to master PFM. So I'm glad that I started there because all ceramics is just, it's easy now that we have that foundation. So Utah Valley Dental Lab hired me on in the evening when I was going to school during the day. And I started working for them. And at the time, there did half the students work there? (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. I remember they did come in and just look at a couple of our models and our work and just selected. I think there was two of us they selected. So I I felt really important. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Anatomy, you know, this was my art outlet. So I was in heaven. I'm getting paid to provide art. So um, I really enjoyed it. But so I started there as a waxer. Uh, There was, 14 of us, I believe at the time in a basement with Utah wow. Valley. Wow! And I remember we'd sit in this basement and I'll take bets on if it was snowing or raining outside because <laughs> we had no windows. Um, and it, yeah, it's incredible where Utah Valley Dental Lab has, has taken it now. So I, I believe when I left there, they were close to 40 technicians and we had remodeled with beautiful Italian desks and we had really advanced in cosmetic dentistry I became one of their top cosmetic ceramists at that time. And then, of course, you know, I'm Utah, so I decided to have a baby. Yes. I, mm-hmm. I came back to work after my first baby and just, yeah, so I worked full time and then had my second baby and then decided I'm going to stay home. That really your kids only, you only get five years with them and then they're gone to school. And so I did take some time off. I did some work from home on this side for them. So I kept in contact with them for about five years. And then I had my third baby <laughs> and decided, um, and you, you tall Wow. Yeah, I know okay. we're just fast, you know, <laughs> young and having these babies quick. I did stop at three, which is kind of rare for Utah, right? Usually. We <laughs> so, you know, when it was kind of an interesting time when I had my third, actually, I had my third in 2008, the summer of 2008. And that's when the economy tanked. Mm-hmm. So the economy tanked. We had just bought a house like a year or so before. And I, I would say one in every five homes in my neighborhood filed for bankruptcy or foreclosure. And my husband at the time lost his job. That company went completely down. Oh, so geez. here yeah. I have this new baby. I have three kids at home that they're not in school. It's the summertime. And I made the decision, okay, do I go back to work or do I do something from home? And when I looked at the cost of daycare at the time, it's about 1500 a month for three children, which is probably pretty inexpensive compared to nowadays. But sure. the amount of time I would need to work just to cover daycare 
Gosh, it was intense. Yeah. And I remember with my first baby working full time, I had a storage closet at Utah Valley Dental Lab. I would go in and pump my breast milk, you know, uh-huh. every every and two then- hours. I thought <laughs> yeah. you were going to say you put the baby in there. Yeah. <laughs> it would be great if I could take my baby to work for sure, but that's a whole other challenge. So, yeah. So my first one, when I was working full time, there was definitely the obstacles of wanting to still you know, nurse my child. So clocking out, pumping, and then, you know, every two hours. So with my third, I just, I realized, you know, it is such a challenging thing as mothers. We really want to be there with our children, but you know, most, most of us still need to provide for them. So it's, man, I want my cake and I want to eat it too, right? I want to be a mom and I want to be there and still provide for them. I needed to provide for them. So I decided to open a lab in my home. And I remember I, I met with Richard Willis, owner of Utah Valley Dental Lab at the time. And, and I told him, I think I'm going to open a lab from home. And he told me I was pretty much nuts. <laughs> I was like, going to say, how did that go? <laughs> yeah. And, and to be fair, like at 30 years old, so on my 30th birthday, April 6th, I went and opened um, a business license and started my laboratory. And I was incredibly shy, incredibly shy. And people do not know this nowadays. But I could barely talk to a doctor on the phone. I would turn red in the grocery store if a neighbor said hi to me. That's how shy I was. <laughs> that is surprising. I know. Everyone's so surprised. Not anymore, Jessica. I know. Yeah. And it, that was such a funny um, journey for me. One, most of us open a lab based off of our skill, but with no knowledge of how to run a company. So it is definitely a rude awakening. You know, a technician's like, oh yeah, I make this much money for the company. If I do this many teeth per day, I can open my own and make all that money. And then the owner doesn't get any of it. I could have that all to myself, right? And so, no, not all. Once you factor in all the steps and everything, now we're the model technician. Now we're managing accounting or, you know, equipment, all these random things that go into owning a company. It was a lot of late nights. I averaged one to two all-nighters a week um, with my children. My youngest um, baby was born with an immature digestive system. And so he cried. He cried all the time for the first two years. And I can tell you, I found a very good technique. I would wrap him in my lab coat and button him up into my lab coat. And I could bounce him while I was layering ceramics and wow. walking to and from from different positions in the lab. So turn on the suction unit. Yep. You didn't hear anything? Yep. Right? I, I, I did just develop this natural sway while I was, you know, building porcelain crowns or whatever um, stuff I was doing. And, and you know, I, I always joke around. I could teach a really good porcelain layering course of how to nurse your baby and layer porcelain at the same time. <laughs> So, you know, it, it was definitely a challenge. I, I really, really love being a mom. That is my number one joy. I love my children. So when you opened your lab, did you just name it yourself and just convert a garage or how did that all play out? Yeah. So I, I started with one room in my lower level. We had a daylight basement. Yeah. And I came up with the word capture because that's really what we're trying to do is one capture nature capture smiles and allow our patients to really capture who they are with that freedom to express themselves through us. Love it. Yeah. So yeah, I started with one room in my home and it was crazy because I barely had enough money to buy one porcelain furnace and some porcelain powders. I think I bought a waxer. And so I would get impressions from the dentist. I would take that to another lab. They do the model work. I get it back, wax it up, take it to someone else to press it, get it back, porcelain layer it, and ship it out. That's exactly what I was going to ask you. <laughs> that is so creative. Yeah, I think my loan was 15000 when I first started the lab, which I bought a used porcelain furnace from Ivoclar. Yeah. And you know, those porcelain powders were like $50 a bottle. So it's like, what can I make with the least amount of shades possible, right? Yeah. <laughs> And then just, um, I just slowly, slowly saved up until I could buy model room equipment next. And then I eventually bought my pressing oven and just slowly saved up. And, and now I think my laboratory has close to a million dollars in equipment. So it's, it's crazy to see how slow it started. I eventually hired on employees and expanded out in my home to where occupied one 
whole the whole lower level, which was about 1500 square feet. People came to your house to work. Yeah, I loved it. You know, my employees were my family and, you know, they were my business hours. I'd unlock my front door. We actually had inside shoes. So I bought them all inside shoes that they loved. <laughs> so they take off their snow covered shoes at the door and put on some shoes, whatever they selected. Most of us wore slippers, like big fluffy slippers, slippers. Yeah, why not? <laughs> And they would just come in during business hours. And I'd even find one on occasion going through my fridge, eating my leftovers. So, (laughs) but I I really loved it because I do feel our career um, should be personal. We do spend so much time in our job and it should be family. And I know that's a delicate line sometimes with employers and employees, but I've really tried to keep that mindset as I've moved it out of my home. Five minutes ago, you said you were super shy and not <laughs> outgoing. Like, how did you get clients? You had to yeah. visit doctors, right? Yeah, that's a good question. It was funny. Medication? I- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alcohol. Oh, oh, trust me. I did actually have a visit to the doctor once when my two-year-old would not, he would not sleep more than 20 minutes at a time. And I remember the doctor, I was working in the lab. I was bouncing this baby and I took him to the doctor once. I'm like, you got to do something to make this baby sleep. I got to sleep. <laughs> and the doctor looked at me and he goes, I can prescribe you something. And I'm like, you can give baby something to sleep. And he looked at me and goes, no, I can give you something. <laughs> but I realized at that moment, I probably, I probably do look crazy. I, I probably do look crazy right now. I've totally sleep deprived, overworked. <laughs> So when I first started, Emacs was new to me and, you know, I flew to San Francisco and took a course um, with Oliver Bricks. Oh my God. That's so crazy. You were just talking about him. Yeah. I had been communicating with him when he was in Germany. He, I really liked a lot of his work and I debated on flying to Germany. He told me he was coming um, to the Idea Institute. So I flew out there. I think I paid a little over 3000 at the time and took a course from him. And he did a great job, but honestly, with the EMAC system, I went back to my laboratory and realized I cannot, like, I learned how to make an A1 shade. How do I use all these other ingots and all these other materials? So anyways, I ended up spending, I can't remember if it was a year, a little over a year dissecting EMAX in my lab. I fabricated tabs of every different ingot, every different thickness from 0.5 millimeters to two millimeters thickness. And then just tested it and tried to really figure out this material. I think I I mentioned before, I love science. I love math, but I love to dissect things and see how it works. Uh, When I was a little girl, just an example, I took my bike apart to figure out how to change the tire. And I disassembled my entire bike and laid it out with all of its parts. You took the seat off to change the tire? I, I took it completely apart and laid out all the pieces and put it back together I laughed, I laughed at the end because I realized it's actually really easy to remove a tire. I didn't have to take the yeah. entire bike apart. But after that, I knew how to change the brakes. I knew how to tighten the brakes. I knew how to adjust my gears. I learned so much about my bike in doing that. And so that was really my thought process with Emacs is I need to understand the foundation of a material to be great with it. Mm. So I then messaged Iva Clark and I told him, hey, I think you're teaching this material wrong. You can't just teach an A1 shade. You need to teach the foundation so we can create any shade. And so I just told them how I I felt it could be taught. And there was a bunch of technicians that have now retired. Some of them are still there with Iva Clark. But you would die at their comment. Their comment was, who are you? Yeah. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I'm I'm this mom in my my basement. (laughs) You know? So they ended up flying me out there to meet with their board. And I was so nervous. You know, here I am, I'm presenting my research. And some of these technicians are the ones that um, completed the Air Force Manual on Dental Technology. Yeah, And and I'm standing in front of them telling why I think their teaching program's wrong and how I think (laughs) we can change it. (laughs) So Ivo Clark, we have a joke now, those of them that are still there that there's always the bears in the room with me, that whenever I walk in to teach or give a lecture, there'll be someone who feels that maybe they know more than me, or maybe I'm inferior. Yeah. They'll cross their arms and sit there like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. Like, Tap their toes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What's, what's this little girl going to teach me is kind of the attitude I got in the beginning. 
And yeah. by the end of the class, we get hugs and we're family and we've That's all brilliant. learned so much together. So, so I presented that to Iva Clark and they said, great, when can you start teaching? And nice. I just about died. I'm like me teach. <laughs> so, you know, funny story, Barb. So I went home Jensen Dental at the time, I decided to get some training in Europe. I really loved American aesthetics, but they just looked so fake at the time. So I yeah. sought out some advanced training in Europe and flew to Germany a couple times and, and worked with some oral design members and different groups of technicians out there to study European ceramics and techniques. And Jensen Dental decided, hey, we want you to teach. So they flew me to California, interviewed me, and asked if I would um, do some public speaking for them. <laughs> and I told them I would think about it. <laughs> yeah. And I was flying home and I kid you not, I pull out the Delta magazine and it said the first article was the number one thing that holds successful women back in business is their fear of public speaking. Yep. And I was like, ha, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I went home and, and I'm, I'm a religious person. I'm, I'm Mormon. Surprise, surprise. Um, yes, we are normal. Um, and no, there are not several women in my home, although I would love that at times. <laughs> <laughs> I go home and I open up my scriptures. There was a scripture that said, God gives men weaknesses to keep them humble. And when you humble yourself before God, your weaknesses can become your strength. And that really meant a lot to me as an individual because I felt like you need this huge ego to teach and to be a public speaker. And that wasn't me. Like I'm all heart. For those of you that know me, I love people and I care about people. And I could never try to manipulate an audience to feel something. It just feels so artificial to me. So anyways, I did a lot of research on public speaking and the more, you know, articles and YouTube videos and things that I, I watched, actually, the shyer I became, the easier I would blush. Mm. I would go so red. I would go purple and fill my face like on fire. And I finally said, you know what? Forget it. I don't have to have an ego. And I can be shy. You know, people would tell you, don't admit you're shy when you're standing up there on the stage. And I said, forget that. You know, forget that. I am shy. I would rather be in the back of the classroom. But I love what I do. And, and I'm happy to share that with other people. If I can help them become successful in what they're doing, then it's important to me. So who did you say yes to, Jensen so or I Ivo said Clark? yes to Ivo Clark because what? I use their products. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, that's a little bit of a... I try to be really careful. If I'm lecturing, sometimes I'm presenting data and information. But in general, I really only speak on something I, I use every day yeah. and something that I believe in. And yeah. Iva Clark, their products, they're just, their ovens are great. The material's great. The research they put behind their products is really unbeatable when you look at other companies and their competitions. So they spend a lot of time researching their products. And for me to put that in a patient's mouth, I really want to make sure it's been tested and researched and that it is the best. So, so the first time you spoke, what, in front of 5,000 people? <laughs> no, the first time I could tell you it was at Lab Day. Oh, my gosh. It was LMT uh, California, Lab Day West. West, yeah. Wow. I was in my hotel room. I wish we had video of that moment. I was pacing back and forth in the room like, I, can't, I don't do public speaking. Like, <laughs> what was I thinking? Why did I commit to this? I can't do this. And, and then I'm like, no, just get out there and do it anyways. And then I get ready, walk out the door. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not doing this. I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really, I was seriously pacing back and forth my hotel room, trying to make it out the door. And finally I'm like, oh, forget it. Right. Forget it. I'm going to turn red and I'm okay with that. And yeah. I'm going to have a great time anyways. So I went down in front of that audience and I love, I love, love Lab Day West. I love the West Coast group. I'm, I'm a California mm -hmm. girl at heart. My you know, half of my family still lives there. I moved to Utah and still between California and Utah, but nice. um, just such a great group of loving people. And I think that's the beautiful thing about technicians is we really are easygoing. Like we can laugh, yes, we, can we make are. mistakes in front of people and we don't care. Like we know we're yeah. human. Um, lecturing on the clinical side is a whole different world. You have to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to prove your intellect first. And then when you win them over then maybe you can sneak in humor where, you know, <laughs> technicians, we can just make jokes in the beginning. You can drop an F bomb, make oh, a joke really? and everybody loves you. Yeah. yeah. You definitely won't hear me drop an F bomb. Um, we joke around about that. I think it was Joshua 
Plansky, when he was first lecturing, he would drop the F-bomb. He told me I was his opposite because I I never <laughs> yeah. swear and he would always swear. I think he's working on it a little bit now, but yeah, I sometimes I do curse in my head, but it's really rare that you'll ever hear, <laughs> hear me. <laughs> and Iva Clara always jokes around that I'm a cheap date too because I don't drink. <laughs> so they know the bill will always be cheap with me because there's, there's no alcohol. There you go. <laughs> so once you got over your fear and you, you know, were there and you were lecturing, did you fall in love with it right away that day or did it take you a while? You know, I did. I honestly, I feel like we all know what speaks to our soul, right? We have certain yeah. talents and things that be, are very natural to each of us and each person's different. And I found that teaching was natural for me and easy for me. And my love for people, it just comes through. And I feel that people feel that too. They know we're all at the same level and learning together. And I think Iva Clark would agree that my lecturing in my classes, they always booked and they always sold out. And the groups, the, the feedback was always so positive and we'd have so much fun. And most of the feedback I get is that I'm on the same level. They don't feel like I have this ego and we're yeah. this group working together to better ourselves. And it invites so much group participation into my classes and lectures. And that's what I love. I love being a public speaker because we can see one, the journey that everyone's on and if I can help inspire them to go back and, and maybe learn a few things different or be inspired to be better or feel like they have the motivation, the desire to continue doing it every day, then I, I feel accomplished. I feel like I've succeeded. So I really love the dental technology industry and the individuals that are in it. We have so many inc incredible technicians. So just honored to be amongst all of them. <laughs> I can attest to, you know, your ability to connect with people and, and educate as well, because, you know, you've done courses for us all over North America. And I think your ability to be vulnerable and relate to your audience is exceptional. And what I love about Jessica is that you are an artist and sometimes you go to a level that most people won't spend the time to go to. But you're able to say you can get very similar results with not going as far as maybe I do, um, which maybe is a, a little bit more niche with more production labs out there. So I think your ability to adapt to the audience is, is excellent. So if, if anybody ever gets an opportunity to go see Jessica and learn from her, I highly recommend it. Oh, thank you. If only there was an upcoming opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> there, might, there might be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there might be one in uh, Chicago. Don't you have a morphology course and a coloring course or, a, mm -hmm. you know, staining? How, how many courses do you have and how do you curriculum look like now? And how's it evolved? Too many questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started teaching for Iowa Clark. My first class was called Emacs Play. And yeah, I actually I remember published a, a really cool book for them um, that course participants got for free. And I didn't even, I don't even think I charged for that. No, it was great. Yeah, it just, it taught the foundation of the material. And like I said, one thing I learned when I was in Europe and, and working with PFMs in the beginning is sometimes we did have... 20 to 30 porcelain powders, you know, and it was so complex, our layering. And once we got into all ceramics, I was able to kind of learn tips and tricks from other people and then form my own ways to simplify the process without compromising on aesthetics. Hmm. And that's really been my teaching approach is how can we achieve the same level of beautiful aesthetics, but simplify the process. Hmm. So that's really how I started into teaching. So I, I started teaching on Emacs, and then eventually broke down into color theory. I love teaching color theory because once you understand the color palette, you can make any color and you learn how to bend the rules and break the rules and how to create life and vitality inside the crowns. And so I love, you know, a lot of it was a lot of research, a lot of time on my end, but then just simplifying how we, how we teach that to other people so we can make their life a lot easier. So they don't have to spend hours dissecting things in the laboratory. I spent about seven years photographing teeth. You know, as I wanted to advance my own skills as a dental technician, I one would wax teeth and then make a mold of them and pour it up out of stone. And then I would try to see if I could get them to look lifelike in a stone model. So I started photographing natural teeth. You know, I originally went to school for graphic design. So I would take these teeth and put them into Illustrator. 
or Photoshop and create outlines and diagrams and try to really dissect these teeth and see what am I missing? How can I make these look more natural? So I spent about seven years dissecting them when I first opened my laboratory, trying to enhance what I know and what looks natural. Mm -hmm. And then I started teaching morphology. And that is still my favorite class. I have a few that will launch this year in 2024 at our new location. But really, anatomy is simple. We overcomplicate it. And I think that's just the nature of the human brain is as a ceramist, we have color, translucency, opacity, surface texture, you know, shape, all these things that can be so much and it can be so overwhelming. But when we really just dissect the basic anatomy and these mathematical patterns in nature, it can become very easy. So this this morphology program, we do work with sculpting clay. And I love it. Laura, have you seen this this class? Have you taught in the Yes, class? I have. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> it is so fun because one, not everyone's touched sculpting clay. And so they're out of their element. And, and I exactly. love that. Because yeah. so many come in the room, they're like, oh, no, 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 I don't sculpt. And I'm like, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we start with this sculpting clay, I teach them these basic mathematical patterns and they learn very quickly, wow, I actually can create this. And with sculpting clay, we can manipulate the shape really fast from triangular to square to round. And you can really grasp the concept of what anatomy belongs to each shape and how to quickly alter that. So sculpting clay is a perfect medium to work with when teaching anatomy. So I did teach that for Ivoclar for a while. It doesn't really relate to any products. And that's kind of the, the tricky part that the anatomy program had. That's why I've just branched out and, and taught at my facility. Sometimes I go into larger laboratories and work with their team and teach them anatomy. But, yeah. but for those of you that have been to that program, it's fun. I, you know, we, I try to add some humor into it to help us remember shape and anatomy. You know, we do have like funny sayings, like say no to plumber's crack that applies to our bicuspids. We can talk about that later on and <laughs> you know, the, the owl face or the nose, you know, there's a lot of images and things that we bring in so that it really stays in our memory. We can really understand how to build that shape. So I love anatomy. Absolutely love character and a smile, love the different shapes and variations and how that can enhance the appearance of a smile too. So I don't think I've touched clay since I was in middle school, honestly. <laughs> it's been a long time. How can you help just a digital designer get more and better at their anatomy? Does it work the same way on a computer? And how can you help them visualize where to go and to make it better and to change the shape? Is that all relative? Yeah, absolutely. I still feel like if they get the sculpting by hand, there's something to be said about learning how to manipulate those line angles really quick with the clay. And then we do relate that over into the CAD software. And it's just a different medium, right? They're yeah. in the digital world. Yeah, absolutely. The same things apply to the digital world. So we start out with sculpting clay. If we're doing a CAD course, we'll start out with sculpting clay, go through those variations of shapes and key areas of focus. And then we go into the digital software and apply that. So absolutely, it's easy to teach with CAD. I think CAD's almost easier in some ways because the reflective line angles are exaggerated. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so you can see those line angles easier in the software where when you're working with wax and porcelain, that's a little muted. But it's yeah. definitely two different mediums, right? It's really hard for those of us that have worked with ceramics and wax by hand to move yeah. over into the CAD world. I think my head moved more than the mouse was moving when I first started <laughs> into the CAD. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense though. Yeah. Video gaming, yeah. you're trying to turn your head to move whatever's on the screen. Oh yes, yeah. the Mario Kart turn, you just yeah. lean. <laughs> yeah, you know, I do all my designing right now. So I, my team's trained to get them, you know, most of the way there. And then I just, I touch them up a little bit. You know, yeah. technology is so advanced nowadays that a lot of these designs, they're pretty good. They just need a little bit of finessing. So I do feel our CAD designers, if we can learn that basic anatomy, and then even more importantly, how do we apply that to those individuals to honor their characteristic? Um, yeah. That's key. And that's really what I've specialized in the last, I would say, seven years is studying character, the character in a smile. And there's a few things that we teach in the anatomy program that it's not really about face shape, it's about tooth analysis. And there's a few little clues that are so simple when you look in the mouth that will tell you exactly what shape they should have. 
if it's triangular, round, square, and even what ethnicity they are. So I did study a lot of dental anthropology, and I have a few dental anthropology books here. There's a gentleman out of Arizona State University, a dental anthropologist wing there, and they actually published some really cool things on dental anatomy that helps you understand ethnicity. We have a new center here. We can talk about that in a moment, but I meet with all new patients and take their photography, and I can tell them so much about their mouth. I can look in their mouth and say what ethnicity they are, you know, if their teeth are round or square, sassy, bold, soft, right? And and how that honors their character. And then when we're looking into smile design, this is something we're going to be talking about at the Chicago Midwinter, is how do we simplify these smile design approaches? How do we gather the right information to quickly assess what smile and shape belongs to this patient? And then how do we build that? And I'm super, super excited about that because now that I've had the opportunity to work with our new clinic that we have here in Draper, Utah, I get the opportunity to work chairside with these patients in designing their smile. So I'm going to be sharing some simple tools and tips on how we can quickly compose a smile makeover and for lab technicians, how they communicate that to their dentist. And you'd be surprised technicians. Well, we're not surprised, but technicians, (laughs) technicians, we're the anatomy specialists. We really know more about anatomy than the dentist. And that is a huge advantage when you learn how to compose a patient's smile. That's, we are a huge resource that the dentist, they're not capable of doing that on their own. And so it's, it's building in those tools of communication with the dentist so that that laboratory can be that specialist and really help elevate our cosmetic smile makeovers. Yeah. Okay. So sassy teeth yes uh did i hear that right yes <laughs> what is a sassy tooth if you're i don't know if you're married are you married elvis my oh yeah, yeah he's married so if your wife's okay with you looking at victoria's secret models you can um, google a couple of victoria's secret models and most of the time when we're looking for this sexy sultry look you'll notice they close their mouth and then just part their lips just a little bit so you see their centrals. Centrals are always more prominent on a sexy, sultry look, and laterals are tucked behind slightly and a little bit shorter. Nowadays, our models are changing a little bit. You know, now we're supporting all different types of face and shape and body size, but traditionally, that sexy, sultry look had centrals more prominent and forward and laterals tucked behind. And so sometimes women don't like if their centrals feel a little bit bigger, but honestly, it it works with most women's face. And I tell them, hey, you just got that sexy Victoria look. You just can't Mm -hmm. help it. Like, (laughs) But, you know, when we're looking at creating sass, sass tends to be more square, prominent centrals and rounder, softer laterals. And if you notice women that have more of a square incisal edge on their centrals, but rounded softer laterals, it does create a little bit of sass in their personality, more playfulness to them. And typically we don't put square centrals on a, on a female. We always want to round them out, but it can work well. I've got a sister that's quite a bit younger than me and she has these square, slightly larger centrals with rounded laterals. And she's just got such a cute, playful, sassy look. So do you tell her that? Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) it doesn't work on everyone. Right. And, And that's what we have to be mindful of when we're looking at face shape is, you know, what kind of characteristic, you know, what, what personality do they have and how do we carry that through with their facial anatomy and and bring that personality. I'm taking notes. Next time I get veneers, I'm going with the sassy look. <laughs> well, totally you can always it. do a consultation and, and I'll show you. Nowadays with um, digital technology like ExoCAD, we can take a picture of your face and virtually try yeah. on different teeth, which is so cool. That is neat. Yeah, I love it though. I love it when we can look at a patient and say, hey, this is exactly what shape belongs to you. And see, this is your personality. And look, this is your ethnicity. I feel like patients actually really geek out on that with me, which is satisfying since, so I'm not the only nerd in the room, right? I geek <laughs> out on all this anatomy. Um, yeah. Patients really are fascinated to know that. And we also can see their wear patterns, right? Dental technicians understand that way more in depth than dentists do. We can see, you know, if they're just wearing their anteriors or they're wearing their posteriors or they have Mm -hmm. posterior interferences and what's causing that. So we can very quickly dissect functional issues in the patient's mouth too, which 
which is a huge, valuable skill that we can offer to the clinical side as well. I think you could turn this into dental fortune telling. Yeah. Where, uh, you know, you you look at someone's teeth, the next thing you know, you know their personality, and you're really digging into their life, all because of their teeth. Yeah. You know what? We've actually, it can be very emotional. <laughs> It can be. I've actually had patients cry in the chair because you are dissecting what's going on in their mouth. And so this new center, um, I took the COIS course years ago. And if you have not taken a COIS course, um, functional, I think it was functional aesthetics. I took a three-day program through him. He is by far my favorite theory or a course on function. Mm -hmm. And he really looks at what nature is saying. So anyways, I took his program and he recommended we read the book, How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. I got that book for Christmas. Good for you. I I really (laughs) recommend you listen to it on Audible unless you like a medical encyclopedia, then go ahead and read the book. But um, it's an intense, I think it's 18 hours on Audible. And I've read it three times and I still feel like there's so much information that I did buy the book and highlight it. And I have different pages bookmarked, but everyone should read that book. It helps you learn Mm -hmm. how to dissect your own health. Sometimes even avoid going to the doctor because you'll end up knowing more than the doctor is. You know, the medical system really does rely on prescription and they just don't have the time to look at what's going on in your body. So Mm -hmm. that book really helps dissect your body and what's going on so you can start to troubleshoot your own body and enhance your overall health. So I did that. I read that book and I started working with Park City Dental Spa. They bring in actors and models and, you know, high profile patients. I started going in there and working one to two days a week with them seating these crowns chair side. And I started recognizing so much about their health. I would say 60 to 70% of patients have gut issues. And they're Mm -hmm. not being addressed. And that gut issue is what's linked to gluten sensitivities, diet sensitivities, Mm -hmm. but breakdown of teeth. And so the dentist really has the opportunity to look into the patient's mouth and say, what is going on? It is a window into the body. And they can look at biofilm, all different types of things and say, you know, what's going on? So you can look in a patient's mouth and say, hey, you've got excess biofilm. It looks like your acidity is high. We can do pH testing. So we built this new facility. Um, I opened it a little over a year ago. I'm super excited. It was three years in the making. So, oh my gosh, it was all during COVID. So it was just a nightmare trying to get this building up and going. But this new building now houses my laboratory, which this April will be 15 years ago that I started. It houses an education center with a nutritional cooking kitchen and education room for all health. And then our dental practice, which has five dental operatories and two medical operatories. So we've now teamed up with functional medicine practitioners, and they are going to start working out of our facility as of this year. We're super excited. And then together with both dentist and functional medicine practitioners, we can look at health as a whole. And that's really how, you know, dentistry, if you think about it, we have the opportunity to see patients every six months for their cleaning, hoping they get a cleaning. And during that six months, we can regulate their health. We can monitor their health. We can see if all of a sudden they're starting to have breakdown, uh, they're building up plaque at a higher rate, you know, their gingivitis, periodontal disease, different things like that. That's all an indicator that something's going on in the body. And so now we can look at those things every six months. And if something changes, we can have them get their blood work done with our doctors and take a look and see what's going on. And no one goes to the doctor, if you think about it, until they already have symptoms. Something's already up. And at that point, sometimes it's too late. So, but the other thing is, is Dennis, you know, okay, so we get this patient in the chair and we can look at him and say, okay, you're, you've got, you know, your teeth are breaking down, your pH is off. What's causing your pH to be off? And pH is usually two things. It's either diet or stress. Those are the two biggest factors. The other thing that can be there is chemo, you know, radiation, chemotherapy, Mm -hmm. or toxins. So medication and toxins, those are two other factors as well. If we rule out toxins and medication, it's usually stress and diet. And now what does a dentist do with that? Like, how can we treat their diet and stress? So that's why we created this center here where we have, we've teamed up with different health coaches, nutritional coaches, even relationship coaches, which I'm so excited we'll share later on 
So now we can say, hey, we can pinpoint, is it their nutrition? Okay, let's build you into a nutritional program. Here's a coach to support you. And better yet, come take some classes with a group so we can teach you how to make cooking fun and taste good, right? So it really is a whole health wow. approach. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole new meaning to new teeth, new you. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's this year we're launching the education program. So we've got our coaches in place and we're getting ready to start planning out our schedule, our calendar. It's a big project. It's going to take a long time for me to fully develop. But really, we're taking people that are already trying to make a difference in, in the lives of in others with nutrition, with health, with relationship, with fitness and finance. And we're pairing them all together in a system where we all communicate with each other. And that's really what medical is starting to shift into is, is um, you know, treatment planning together with all these different specialists, all these different specialties so that we can communicate individuals needs and make sure we're getting the results that we want. So in the heart of this in everything got started by a dental technician. I love it. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Awesome. It's so funny. The mindset of like, you, you'd be surprised. So this year, as of the end of December of 2023, I took over full ownership of the dental practice. I had a, a dentist that was a partner in the beginning. So I took over full ownership in Utah. I can own a dental practice a hundred percent, which nice. was scary like to that. me at first, but exciting because now we can really elevate this this whole health approach. So this center, we focus on one, a high level of aesthetics because we can customize, you know, your teeth chair side. And then we focus on a high level of health and treatment planning for longevity. And this is really our headquarters, our research center, where we are going to create all these structures for screening patients so we can teach other doctors and implement this into practices nationwide. So we're super excited. We're super excited. And we've got a couple of great dentists that are teaming up with us this year that believe in whole health and one offering better products, better systems and things that are not as toxic to the body, but also just screening the patient for really looking at them, seeing what's going on in their body. Um, so super excited. It's, it's just now really taking off this year. This is my life vision. And I'm sure I'm going to be working on this as long as I have breath in my body. I, I will continue to elevate this vision. It's been beautiful. But going back to your comment, Elvis, absolutely, you can get a patient in the chair and you can see so much about them. You can you can see, honestly, like bulimia, right? Are they struggling with their yeah. diet? Are they struggling with trying to keep weight off and not such a personal thing? Are they struggling with sugar and acidic foods? Are they stressed? And if so, where are they stressing? And when we ask these questions, we ask them um, on a, if they get a questionnaire before they even come into the office so we can assess all these areas. But you'd be surprised when we talk to the patient and say, okay, your teeth are breaking down faster than they should. Tell me what's going on in your life. It does look like you've marked a few boxes saying you have a little bit of stress going on in your life. And you'd be surprised, one, how happy the patient is that someone actually cares right? Yeah. And now it's like, okay, let's look at that. And now I'm part of your support group. Let's, let's elevate this together. Let's work through this together. Yeah. So it can be really emotional when we get these patients in the chair and beautiful at the same time, because we do have options to help them elevate their life. So. Well, what's amazing to us is that you still have time during all this to come to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, True. that will be my vacation. Did I not tell yeah. you that was my vacation? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm showing up late, maybe I was in the bathtub a little longer. No, just kidding. <laughs> there you go. No, I'm super excited to come to Chicago. One, it's just great to get out and see all the new products and what everyone's lecturing on and teaching on all the great new information and reconnect with everyone face to face. I, I love yeah. this Chicago midwinter meeting as well. So so you're speaking in the Iva Clark ballroom that Saturday during lab day. Yes. And you kind of talked about what you're going to be talking about. But what exactly are you covering? Well, one, I noticed Thank you, Iva Clar Laura. I'm going to have to razz you about this. I am at the end of the day Saturday, which means we're saving the best for last, right? Yeah, okay. of course. If you're trying to sneak out of there early, 
then sneak into our room because I am definitely saving the best for last. We are so excited to reveal a documentary that we have been filming all of 2023. We filmed a documentary that will be aired on YouTube after the Chicago Midwinter Meeting, and I'm releasing a sneak peek with the QR code for everyone. It's a documentary of a smile makeover. It's behind the scenes of a smile makeover. It's a how it's made video. Awesome. And super excited. Our goal with the general public was to show the science and the technology that goes into building a smile and also capture the patient's emotional experience along the way. So we have an actor slash model that has actually trained herself to sing with her lip down um, when she's on stage, which is incredibly difficult. Because of her teeth. Yeah, because her, her teeth. She was really embarrassed with her smile, which is the case with a lot of people. A lot of people just did not grow up with good dentistry or their parents. Yeah, sure. Oh. And so many people are embarrassed about that. So we captured her journey of this smile makeover. And I could tell you, we hired a professional film crew. Iva Clark is one of our sponsors. Thank you, Iva Clark, for helping us bring this vision forward. But we're super excited to be able to share it at the Chicago Midwinter Meeting. This will be our launch of our documentary. So awesome! not only am I launching this video, I'll be sharing ways that you can simplify these smile makeovers tools that technicians can use to very easily communicate their skill level with shape and anatomy and what information we need to gather to make this all happen. So super excited. Yeah. Looking forward to it. That sounds great. Laura. Yeah. Laura. Jessica, thank you so much. (laughs) We got to move on to what else is happening during Lab Day Chicago. Yeah. Laura, you want to run us down what all exciting things are happening in the ballroom, other than Barb and I, of course. Well, Barb and you are the main (laughs) attraction. (laughs) Something we started last year and we're super excited to continue with is to have both of you there. I think you guys bring an amazing energy. We get to meet new people. You get to meet new people. Like you've Mm -hmm. been wanting to have Jessica, and I know there's a few others that will get you to interview as well. So it's going to be some really great energy in the ballroom again this year. We've got some fun stuff planned. Our theme this year is called Benchtop Heroes. And I think, you know, just listening to Jessica and everything that she's doing with her facility and the Institute and, you know, how, how much you all care about the patients that you are making restorations for and doing makeovers for, it's because you really are the heroes that deliver to the patients that restoration not only to the patients, but to the doctors. And sometimes you have very little to go on and you really are those magicians and you know that come up with this amazing prosthesis and restoration. So it's all about the lab technician and we're calling them you bench top heroes for that reason. So I love that theme. That's a great theme, just saying. Yeah. Will there be capes? Yeah. They're, oh, you know what, Elvis, you always have a really good idea. I think we, maybe there's something. Well, there, there's something to that. We'll talk after the podcast. But, okay. yeah. <laughs> I better start working out if I've got to dress like Wonder Woman for this lecture. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I just want a reason to run around with a cape on. That's yes. all. <laughs> it's actually a really cool idea. But yeah, Benchtop Heroes is our theme. And so it's just about celebrating the lab technician. We're going to have a really cool photo booth. We're going to have you there. We also have a, an education session on the Thursday that's about um, iVotion Digital Denture um, and Design with 3Shape. So that you can sign up through LMT website. Um, and that's on Thursday from 1 till 5. And then... So wait uh, a minute, a four-hour course on designing digital dentures? Well, I mean, you got to start That's amazing. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right? I know. That's amazing. But yeah, it's a four-hour course. We'll have some hands-on spots and participants. But then you could also be there to be an observer as well. Sure. You know, some people don't know where to start. Some people have started and need some assistance. And this is a way for us to offer it in, I mean, what better venue to offer it in than, you know, LMT Chicago. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then we'll have other courses that we'll run throughout the year at the Avaclar Academy, of course. But this is um this is a way to get to everybody and, and give them the help that they need. So we'll have that on the Thursday. And then Friday and Saturday is where the two of you come in. So you'll be there, I believe, 
approximately nine or so till three um, yep. throughout the day. I'm sure you'll be talking about it. And um, we might mention it a few times, might. <laughs> not too often, but yeah. yeah. Um, so Friday and Saturday from eight until four, basically we're running with, um, we have a really amazing lineup this year. Jessica obviously is one of them. We've got a duo from Canada. I got to do a shout out there with Luke LaRock Walker and Paul Imperius doing a two hour session on digital ventures and transitioning there. We've got John Wilson talking about technology at Dr. Ed McLaren, BJ Kowalski, Lee Culp. I mean, the list goes on. We've got a really great lineup. So do go on to LMT.com, check out what we're bringing to LMT. And we sure hope to see you there. And I just want to say a huge thank you to Elvis and to Barbara for all the support that you show us. And we're really happy to have you as part of the Apiclar family. So thank you. Thank you. And Jessica, congratulations on everything that you're doing. I can't wait to see you oh. uh, in February. Same. I'm super excited to see you, Laura. I've, I've, Canada has always been part of my heart. I, I love teaching there, a great group of people, and you've always been a part of that. So I just want to thank Iva Clark too. I think everyone knows you always put on the best lectures, the best parties, the best entertainment, and the <laughs> best products. So I just want to thank Elvis and Barb too for your time and I've been checking out my my whole team's actually been listening to voices from the bench super excited to be a part of it thank you for having me and thank you Laura and the Iva Clark team too for everything you do for our profession oh you're welcome thank you I feel the love you guys yeah (laughs) you're making me emotional last year there was a pretty epic party (laughs) there was is that happening again this year well you only turned 100 once all this oh well 101 uh, is just as exciting <laughs> true. uh no we'll be doing smaller little events um here and there throughout the the few days you know chicago is such a huge endeavor for us it's not just the lmt ballroom it's the exhibit hall it's going to doing the cal lab it's which is going to be great this year Mm -hmm. and mccormick you know we we have to show the doctors what materials they should be asking you for so you know we're in there and then the APROS meeting so we're all over the place this year there's probably not a meeting you won't see us at and but yeah if if there's any events coming up we'll let you know but at this point in time i think we're taking it a little easier this year as you should that was epic it It should end with that (laughs) it's fine if we do need a dance party if you come to my lecture we can start the music right after done it is the end of the day (laughs) there you go i love it (laughs) jessica laura thank thank you you so much we appreciate you for coming on jessica what a great story i feel like we could have done another hour totally learning about what you've done it's amazing i had no idea Oh, well, um, thank you. Yeah, it's been a journey. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you in Chicago. And Laura, as always, thank you for everything, the support. And yep. Barb oh, and I are ready for a weekend of chatting. We'll see you in a month. Okay, we'll see you then. Yep. All right, thanks, yeah. everybody. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye. A huge thank you to Jessica and to Laura for coming on our podcast. And as always... We are super appreciative of Laura and the rest of Ibaclar for hosting us again at Lab Day Chicago, even though we said we weren't going to mention Lab Day Chicago, but supporting the industry in general, you guys are amazing. Trust us, we say the industry notices and remembers when companies support it. Congratulations, Jessica, on your, all your well-deserved success. We cannot believe it took you so long to be on our podcast, Jessica, but way to go. We are so glad we finally did, and what an amazing story you have. We cannot wait to see the documentary and see what amazing things that you do at this clinic. Seriously, everybody, go check her out on stage. It's the Ivaclar Ballroom on Saturday from 3.15 to 4.15. Who knows? She might be even dressed as Wonder Woman. Sweet. (laughs) I bet she will be, actually. She's pretty awesome. That would be amazing. All right, everybody. That's all we got for you. And peace. We'll talk to you next week. Have a great week, all. Bye.
Well, hold on. Let me just get some vodka. The views and opinions expressed on the Voices from the Bench podcast are those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the host or Voices from the Bench, LLC.